Thanks. Okay, so um, we are recording this conversation for members who are unable to make the session. Um, as an introduction, I'm Liz Kramer, the chair of the CMC. Uh, for some accessibility guidance here, uh, we have closed captioning currently enabled. You can access that on your bottom menu bar on Zoom. Please be sure to enunciate clearly into your microphone in order to help make sure that that works effectively. If there's any and any other accommodations that you ever need, you can always reach out to me um, and we will make sure that we get those scheduled. So uh, welcome everyone to the Community Mobility Committee. Uh, as a reminder, this is a place for residents and interested individuals to advocate for, learn about, um, and provide feedback on mobility and transportation issues in the city of St. Louis. Um, because of our purpose here, we really encourage everyone to be respectful in our conversations and questions. We're really grateful to have so many folks from the city who regularly participate in these conversations. Um, and we want to be encouraging of everyone to, um, to be respectful of their hard work and efforts, as well as the many varying opinions we have within this group. To that end, uh, please avoid jargon and acronyms. If you're using a technical transportation term, please define it and ideally share a link in the chat. Uh, not all of our members are as familiar with transportation or planning language, and we want to be able to create an inclusive space for learning. I also want to encourage everyone uh, to be mindful of time. We're going to have a lot of comments and discussion today in particular, um, so uh, please be sensitive to how much time you are taking up. We're also going to have detailed note taking, thanks to Don Walter, our secretary. Um, so if there's follow up that we need to do after this session, we will be doing that afterwards. Um, please do use the chat um, as a place for raising questions or um, adding additional clarification or seconding things that folks are saying. That is all also documented and captured um, in our notes. So as I mentioned, we're really lucky to have a great partnership um, with the city staff. We, I think we actually just have one person who's here today. Uh, so I'm going uh, to ask Andrew to quickly introduce himself and say hello. So hello, I'm Andrew Lackey. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the Office on the Disabled for the City of St. Louis. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and then I'm also going to ask uh, Taylor to introduce himself and say hello. Hi, I'm Taylor March. I'm the Vice Chair for the CMC. Great. Okay. So a um, couple of items for us to cover up front. Give me just a second. Um, I'm dropping into the chat our agenda for today, and then I will also drop into the chat our notes from the September meeting, which was our last meeting. Um, the notes have been shared before, they're shared in October, they're also shared uh, most recently in the announcement email. Um, are there any questions or concerns about our notes before we publish them later today? Great. Okay, we're going to move right into our uh, our first main section. So uh, actually, I'm going to let Grace get in here and introduce herself before we start that. Give her just a second. Hi, Grace. Do you want to say hello quickly? I know you've just arrived. Hi, everyone. Sorry to be a few minutes late. Uh, do I need to say anything else, Liz? Do you want to say who you are? <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Grace Chung with the mayor's office. Um, we haven't had a chance to talk. Senior strategic initiatives manager. And one of the projects I focus on is around transportation. Great. Thank you so much for being here today, Grace. OK, so our first uh, our first topic, as we have every meeting, um, we have an open opportunity for folks to share concerns. Um, rather than have a dialogue about the issues that we're raising today, um, we really want to hear your observations, your concerns, the things you've heard from your community. Um, we will document that. And if there are questions or follow up that need to happen with specific city departments or partners, um, we'll make sure that that happens after the meeting and we'll be back in touch with you and also include those responses um, within the notes from the next meeting. Um, so that will help us stay both on time and also not put our city partners who may not be the right folks to answer those questions on the spot here in the room. Um, I do also want to make a note that our big agenda item today is Board Bill 120, which is ARPA fund distribution, and we will have a lot of time for discussion about that. So if you have comments related to Board Bill 120, um, you might want to hold on to those so that we can have them in the sort of full discussion. Okay, 
Um, I, I'm going to share a comment that was uh, sent to me by a member who's not able to be here today, um, and then we'll open up the floor. So um, Wendy McDaniel, who is a member of the CMC, reached out. Um, Wendy is deaf and regularly takes the bus. Um, she said, uh, since there's a shortage of bus drivers, I can't call for Metro Dispatch to help get a lift home. Um, is there any text number that I can use to reach the St. Louis Metro when the bus doesn't come? The bus didn't come twice this weekend after work. Um, and on Saturday, a staff who was uh, working for Metro was able to call dispatch and got me a lift. But yesterday, I waited for an hour and a half and ended up walking to the train and taking the 70 bus from Grand, which was scary because there were strange people on the bridge. Um, it happened last Friday also. Uh, and then my concern is that I'm deaf and what if my cell phone battery goes out after work and it's, snow it's snowing, what do I do? So uh, um, I just want to emphasize in, in this particular comment and in the conversation I've had with Wendy, um, we've shared this back to Bi-State so they are aware of the problems with the system and the concerns about accessibility, um, but that making sure that we have a system that is accessible for everyone and able to fill in the gaps is something that is particularly critical and concerning. Okay, so um, are there any other comments, issues, things that folks wanna raise to the committee or um, to our partners at the city? Hey Liz, um, I just had a wanted to um, share our experiences we've had uh, down with Beworks. We we uh, we had a, one of our staff members, significant others, was hit by a car um, in the Central West End um, a little while ago um, between meetings, um, and then we also had a student um, from our programs get hit uh, a couple weeks back as well. Um, you know, they both have horrible circumstances, all those things um, that we have come to expect from these. But um, I wanted to share that basically what we saw with both police reports um, were major errors in how they were being documented by the police departments. Um, everything from, you know, labeling cyclists as pedestrians in the reports to um, incorrect speed limits um, in the reports to not taking the time to collect witness information or camera information. Um, the uh, coworkers, uh, significant other that was hit, was um, hit in the Cortex district. Um, we were able to find five different camera angles that all caught the crash. Um, the police didn't bother to take any of that, get any of that information. Um, there were uh, three or four people that bothered to stop and help and call 911 um, for an ambulance. Uh, none of that witness information was collected. Um, in the instance of our students, um, same exact thing. Uh, witness information was not collected. Uh, the driver actually fled the scene and left the student alone, um, uh, was not charged, yada, 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 yada. Just, you know, wanted to share our experience and our frustration with um, how these incidences and how, how these crashes are being um, documented and how much harder it's making um, everything on our end uh, to go and fight uh, for these people that have been uh, victims of these crashes. Patrick, thank you so much for sharing that. And and Patrick, if you're willing, would you share the GoFundMe links for um, your colleagues in the chat so that folks have that if they um, want to see that? Um, and I think that is also really helpful information to we we have managed to ha have one conversation with um, SLMPD about um, crash data, and we're we're sort of just at the very beginning of that conversation. Um, Thank you for sharing that. I'm really I'm sorry to hear that how much more complicated this has been. Is there anyone else who has any concerns, comments, things they've observed or experienced they want to share? Liz, I just had one quick thing. Um, I noticed while around St. Louis, uh, specifically downtown and a little bit of Tower Grove Ave that um, you know, the few bike lanes that we do have in the city of St. Louis are really, really starting to fade. Even lane lines are starting to fade. I was actually driving with a coworker 
uh, back to our warehouse and like he was just kind of driving like it was a one lane road and I had to be like, you know, this is like you can you get need to go over to the left is, but, because there's no lane markings there and stuff like that. And so, but specifically more to bike lanes, you know, for example, Tower Grove Ave, like even before that gets reconstructed and stuff like that, you know, that that's probably one of the highest bike routes in the city of St. Louis and, you know, whatever we can do just to like, I mean, it's Tower Grove Ave is maybe a mile and a half. Those two other roads are, you know, 11th and um, Pine uh, are like, you know, half mile too much. Like it, it shouldn't be too much work to get those repainted and just to like, again, delineate that these are bike spaces and not spaces for cars. So um, that's just one thing there. I'm not sure if there's a restriping plan or anything, but you know, for like the six bike lanes that we do have in the city of St. Louis, it'd be great if they, people actually knew they were bike lanes. Thanks, Sam. And we'll share that directly to streets as well. Hey, uh, Liz, this is uh, Michael Reidenauer. Um, let's see, so hello everyone. This is my first uh, meeting as a member of the CMC. So brief introduction, Michael Reidenauer, lived in, Tower, in Central West End for nearly four years, recently moved to Tower Grove South. Um, to kind of piggyback on Taylor's point about um, faded bike lanes, I have also rode on the um, Tower Grove bike lane near the Botanical Garden uh, for years and, and you know, seen the same thing um, of faded lines as well as uh, crumbling bike infrastructure of the pavement of the pavement that it's on. But also um, it's the same issue as well in, in the Forest Park bicycling lanes as well. Um, faded bike lanes, crumbling infrastructure, crumbling bike lanes as well and also very poor designs of um, uh, that in, almost encourages drivers to drive on the bike lane itself or, or particularly park within the bike lane also. Um, but I'm not sure if just painting over the lines and making them brighter would solve that issue because um, it seems to be more of a encouragement of a, of a user design flaw than it is just people being lazy. Thank you, um, and, and thanks, Aubrey, for pointing out Russell as well in the chat. Okay, take uh, if there, one final moment, if there's any other comments on other topics, um, anything else we wanna make sure we're sharing. Okay. Um, I'm going to move us into our next uh, item. So today we are going to talk about um, primarily about Board Bill 120. I sent the link to this earlier. Here is the link again. Um, you, as as I shared, uh, this bill was introduced on uh, November 10th, um, and it will be heard by the Housing, Urban Development, and Zoning Committee. I'll talk a little bit more about um, in the near future. So I'm going to give a brief overview about what's in the bill and how it relates to the CMC's work. Um, our goal in this section of our meeting today is to really seek feedback, comment, question from our members. We are not going to be answering most of those questions in this session. Um, we're not going to make Grace answer all of our questions. Uh, so our goal here is to really collect the feedback from this group so that we can put out um, a statement about how we are responding to this, what we would like to, how we would like to see this work implemented, um, any changes or support that we want to offer to the elders and to the administration in moving this forward. Um, our hope is to have that letter uh, drafted and then issued uh, by next week. Uh, so the voting members will hear from me with a draft of that letter. Um, I think most of the voting members have been through this process. Um, so we'll draft the letter. There will be an opportunity for comment and input. Um, and then there will be a vote uh, to endorse that for us to send it forward to the alders and to the administration. Um, and I want to say that one outcome from this is that we also hope that individual members of the CMC um, who are participating in the session today, they may want to send feedback or comment to their own older person um, as part of the testimony on this bill as well. Okay, so I am going to share my screen. All right, everybody able to see my screen? Great. Yes. Thank you, Taylor. 
Um, okay, so first of all, what is ARPA? Uh, why am I using an acronym when I said don't use acronyms? So ARPA is the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, it was a $1.9 trillion federal aid package that was passed in March of 2021. Um, it's intended to provide financial aid to families, governments, businesses, schools, nonprofits, and others that are impacted by the pandemic. Um, $350 billion of that is going to state and local governments as part of the Fiscal Recovery Fund. And the city of St. Louis in particular uh, uh, received $498 million from uh, ARPA. Our first payment was received in June, and the funds have to be assigned by the end of 2024 and spent by the end of 2026. So we have a relatively narrow timeline to accomplish this. Um, ARPA funds can be used to respond to public health emergencies or the negative economic impact of those. They can provide premium pay to eligible workers. They can provide government services, and they can invest in sewer, water, or broadband. They can't be used to reduce taxes, to deposit into pension funds, to fund debt service, to fund legal settlements or judgments, or for deposits into rainy day funds or financial reserves. So just so you know what's allowed within ARPA. Um, so in order for ARPA to happen, for us to spend this money, it has to go through the Board of Aldermen's process. This is the picture of how a bill becomes a law. Um, during the process, bills can be changed, and many of them have been. Some of you may recall some of the past bills. So, uh, for example, um, Board Bill 184, um, which was voted into law in the spring of 2022, um, that included things like the allocations for arterial paving on Union Grand and Kings Highway. Um, it, many of you may remember that the CMC asked in May for ARPA funds to include traffic calming and safety considerations on these segments, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, so Board Bill 184 made its way through this process of having a first reading, being assigned to committee, going to a second reading, going through the process of the Board of Aldermen, and then ultimately being signed into law, and it's now Ordinance 71494. So the bills that we're talking about today, primarily Board Bill 120, is currently at this process where it's going into committee. Um, so there's right now there's three bills that will address the allocation of those remaining ARPA funds. Um, and mostly I'm going to talk about 120. So when that first reading um, happens, what we're seeing is the proposal that comes from the administration and the sponsor of the bill. And then the committee can change the bill. They can kill it. It says the bill may die. Um, and then the bill is going to proceed through these steps to eventually become law and therefore assign where this money goes. Okay, any questions about how a bill becomes a law? I have not subjected anyone to Schoolhouse Rocks, so I think we're doing pretty well so far. So uh, I mentioned there are three bills. Um, I just want to very quickly cover the other two bills, um, which we're not going to spend as much time on today. Um, mostly because they have very small areas that affect the kind of work that the CMC is addressing, but these are still really important, so I want folks to know about them. Um, Board Bill 116 was introduced by Alderman Shameen Clark Hubbard. Um, that bill includes funding for the VM microtransit um, pilots, a million dollars allocated for that. It also includes funding for things like the guaranteed basic income, senior services, housing stabilization, um, youth programs, and sustainability plan. And then Board Bill 125, um, which was introduced by Alderwoman Marlene Davis, um, includes funding for affordable housing, lots of different kinds of things, including production and preservation, um, support for neighborhood beautification and community development, um, and community development corporations, $14 million for that, uh, funding for the LRA, for student assistance, and for property stabilization. Um, I want to note that this bill is functionally the same as Board Bill 111, um, which passed on 118. I, if someone else can explain the difference between those two, I'm happy to open up the floor for that. Grace? Yes, I didn't think that was not me. Um, so Board Bill 111 went through the legislative process, but unfortunately, it missed a step. The step was to approve the funds through ENA, that's Estimate and Appropriateness Committee, uh, that comprises um, Mayor Jones, Comptroller Green, as well as President Ford Balderman. So 
because it missed that important step, unfortunately, the bill needed to be reintroduced and redo the legislative process. Thanks, Grace, for clarifying that. Um, and this is perhaps one reason why I'm not in charge of policy. Okay, so I, all three of the bills that we're talking about today have been referred to the Housing, Urban Development, and Zoning Committee. Um, I want to get us into Board Bill 120. So this bill, um, which I, is introduced by um, Alderman Brandon Bosley, allocates $74 million of ARPA funding into investment in infrastructure. The funds are distributed to the Board of Public Service, uh, Community Development Administration, Public Safety, Information Technology Services, Parks, Rec, and Forestry, and Streets. Um, and I want to emphasize that what we're seeing in this bill is connected back to um, what Mayor Jones um, asked for in her Riverfront Times editorial, um, seeing an investment of uh, at least $40 million to transform our streets as we work towards a comprehensive citywide plan. So that, that is what we're looking for. So today, um, I'm going to really focus in on talking about the distributions to Board of Public Service and streets. Um, and just as a reminder, I think most folks know this, but Board of Public Service is a, essentially our public works department. They contract, design, and implement the projects that happen in the city. And the streets department is the entity that maintains and supports our streets. Um, I think it's also important to note that streets also is over refuse, so they have uh, a lot of responsibilities on their plate. Okay, so within Board Bill 120, there is um, $55 million allocated to the Board of Public Service. I'm going to uh, focus on, on five line items within that. The first one is um, the $12 million for traffic calming, design and implement traffic calming and roadway improvements based on the completed traffic studies. Um, so this could include arterials, but the final locations are yet to be determined. Then we have additional funding to address ADA and traffic calming improvements with five corridors identified in Board Bill 184, which I previously referenced. So that's $14.5 million. Um, so this is adding to the earlier Board Bill um, to include ADA improvements and then modest traffic calming. Um, the Board of Public Service has already solicited engineering firms to design these corridors, and they're in the process of hiring those firms with the goal of having design happen in 2023. Um, these projects are not complete reconstructions. I'm going to talk about uh, a different project later that is, but these are working within our existing curb and roadway street widths. Um, but one thing that is uh, important about this is that it's an opportunity to look at um, all of the full length of some of these corridors, which isn't always possible because of the way that our funding system with older people works. Um, and then this is the specific thing that the CMC asked for in May, um, just to make sure that we look at these things as these streets are repaved. Uh, the third thing is the Greenway North Grand Corridor improvement. So Unlike the previous uh, line item, this is a complete reconstruction and it's affiliated with the brick line. Um, we've talked some about the brick line and we're planning to have Great Rivers Greenway come next year to talk a little bit more about that project. Um, but Great Rivers Greenway is making a very large investment um, with funding that they've received from a number of sources, including the Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity Grant, um, which is also known as the RAISE Grant. That grant covers North Grand from Natural Bridge to Cass, then it goes west on Cass to Spring and down to Page. They have a, that a second grant that goes from Spring to, um, from Page, sorry, from, on Spring from Page to Washington. Uh, they are also pursuing funding to complete that segment all the way to Lindell. So the raise grant covers mostly what's actually the Brookline, which is on the west side of the street. Um, and the city is partnering with GRG in order to make improvements on the east side of the street. So the whole right of way will be um, will be improved. Um, this funding is also something that can be used to leverage additional funding from other sources. Okay, I'm going to skip the public safety answering point. Very important. Not our main topic today. Uh, then we have safety improvements at the top 10 and crash locations, $3.5 million. These locations have not yet been determined, but the hope would be to prioritize areas where this funding could make a difference. And then finally, in the Board of Public Service, we have street paving for arterials, $8 million. 
Um, the location is not currently defined, but this is in addition to the other arterials that have already been identified. Okay, so then we have the streets department. Um, there's two line items that we're going to cover here. The first one is the mobility and transportation master plan. Um, this uh, is funding for a robust planning effort that will include public engagement with the goal that this plan would codify the values and priorities that uh, that help make and shape the decisions about funding and design. Um, there's lots of examples nationally of comparable plans, and the idea is not that this plan would redesign every roadway in the city. It's not going to create shovel-ready projects for everything, but it will give us some consensus and guidance and comprehensive data about what people in St. Louis want to have happen. And then the final item is $6 million in sidewalk improvements, um, which is funding one particular sidewalk program that's run through the streets department. Okay, so uh, that is my overview of what is in the bill. Uh, we have some questions that we want to raise uh, for folks to respond to and think about. Um, First of all, what are you excited about in these funding proposals? What is really shaping where we could go? What do you want to know more about? What do you think is missing? What adjustments would you make? Excuse me. And what do you want the city to know about how these projects should be implemented? So I'm going to stop screen sharing. I'm going to put those in the chat um, and we're going to open up for some questions and comments. Hey, uh, Liz, this is Michael Reidenauer. I would be interested to know, um, would they, would the money be used for um, closing roads for events? I know during the pandemic, um, roads were closed for, to allow impromptu events to pop up, like restaurants. I remember there was a salsa club uh, that got to have a, Got, was allowed to have like a dance party in there as well, as well as different parks as, um, such as Tower Grove and Forest Park were closed for people to essentially uh, play into the play in the road without worrying about cars. So I'd, I'd be curious if this money would, would be used towards anything like that. Thanks, Mike. I don't think that's directly in the infrastructure bill, but that's definitely a question we can raise. Um, and see if there are thoughts on that. Yeah, Liz, I, I can speak to that a little bit as, as someone who is really into that conversation, uh, part of the open space subcommittee. Um, specifically about, I'm gonna touch, Mike, first about the parks. So Tower Grove Park is obviously a separate entity. Uh, they don't have to do anything the city of St. Louis says, they own their own park. Uh, I know they did something. So that's something where, you know, if enough people get together in Tower Grove Park and talk to, um, that group there, um, you know, they, they can close as many roads as they want. I think they have to keep center cross open. I think that's the one thing. Um, but whatever roads north and or east and west, uh, that is up to their discretion. I know Alderwoman Schweitzer was leading a survey, leading a some sort of topic about Carondelet Park and what that means uh, for some of the roads closures in there. They were, they were, a lot of people in that neighborhood were a big fan of it. Um, I'm not sure what the status of that is currently at the moment. Um, and then on Forest Park specifically, I know that Forest Park Forever is doing a large um, kind of overview plan similar to the park and what they want. And I'm not sure, I, I know it was brought up before uh, about, you know, what, what can be done in those parks. The big drawback that that comes for a lot of those things is pavilion rentals, specifically for Tower Grove Park. That was a big thing for, for pavilion rentals and also ADA access. That is, from my understanding, one of the reasons why they kind of pulled back some of those things um, and, and getting people specifically to those points. But there is obviously room uh, for each park, uh, you know, including O'Fallon and, and Fergon, which I didn't talk to as much. Uh, but you know those those parks are all can be can be talked about. We had conversations with uh, I'm blanking on his first name, but uh, Commissioner Hayes from Parks Department about that kind of thing. Um, and you know that's something that we can talk about in further uh, to the, the thought about the open kind of patio expansion stuff. There was something written in the Office of Special Events uh, for that. 
I'm not sure where that's at as well. That's obviously something that they have written down in some sort of policy. Uh, whether they want to bring that back is great. The thing with that is that was a big onus on the property owner and less of a citywide um, initiative. And so again, these uh, currently right now, that was something that the open space subcommittee, which I, which I lead is, was taking on. We're kind of taking a little hiatus for the spring or sorry, for this uh, winter, but I would love to bring that conversation up. If anyone is interested in, in, in that, um, I'm not sure if there's going to be, again, I'm not sure if there's direct funding in the ARPA stuff for that, but it's definitely a, a advocacy push that we can put together in, in terms of the open space subcommittee uh, in, in the spring. Thanks, Sam. Patrick, I saw, I I saw you. Um, Judith, I'm going to, Patrick uh, had his hand up first, and I'll put you right after him. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I just kind of quickly piggyback on Sam's thing. Like the way this is written right now, this is all basically engineering and planning stuff. Right. This is not a safety bill. So, you know, um, basically, when, when this was announced, uh, our organization sent in a letter. Um, you know, we're pretty frustrated that, you know, we're going to spend $40 million on um, a bunch of engineering stuff. Um, and there's not a single penny in here for education or enforcement, uh, not a dime. Um, there is money for the alderman that introduced the bill's park um, to the tune of $400,000. Um, and I'd like to also point out that the person that is introducing this bill was also the person that fought us against CMC's request and everybody else's request to end distracted driving at the automatic level. So. I think it's real interesting who they pick to introduce this bill to start off with. Um, you know, I, I think that it's it's unfortunate that we can't carve out even 1% um, of this budget to put together an education plan, put together an enforcement plan, um, you know, to do anything outside of what we've been doing um, for decades, uh, which is, you know, painting bike lanes and, you know, doing the physical infrastructure stuff. Um, this, you know, for us to not have anything, again, not a single dime carved out, um, you know, to include education, um, it, to me is a huge missed opportunity. And I, I really think we need to change that. Um, so we did, send a, we did send a letter to the mayor's office. Um, I still haven't seen a response um, from that. Um, Megan Green has responded. Um, President Green has responded. Multiple aldermen have now responded that they're also interested in this as well. Um, uh, Trailnet just uh, is, I guess, is sending a similar letter to what ours um, said, and that we're making the request for education funding. Um, both Trauma One hospitals are signing on for um, funding for education for safety stuff. Um, I, you know, it, it's just sad. I mean, we're not, we're not, we're not even at the table. So, like you know, um, for this kind of money to be getting thrown around and this is what we're getting from it. I mean, the way this is currently written and, you know, maybe somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, but I felt like this was the result of several very high profile deaths on South Grant, right? And with Rachel's, you know, amazing work and all the different groups kind of putting some pressure on the city um, the response was, um, you know, was this bill? Um, and the way that this bill is written right now, it's it's not even earmarked for pedestrians or cyclists, right? Like, I mean, the, the way this is written, it's basically like they get to pick the five worst crash areas and, and we're going to redesign those streets. So the fact that, the, that we don't even have a line item that's for pedestrians or for cyclists, um, you know, screams, um, you know, very loudly to what, what's the heart of this bill. 
you know, you couple that with who introduced it. And I mean, I don't, you know, great. We got a bunch of money, but it's not going to go to us. So. Patrick, would you be willing to put a link to the BWorks letter in the chat so folks can read that if they have not seen it? Yeah, I mean, basically, we kind of listed out like five five different things that um, we would love to see. Um, you know, again, this is not our wheelhouse. You know, we 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 primarily concentrate with education on youth, but like, you know, I cannot tell you the amount of time and energy it has taken to educate the families from the latest two crashes that we're interacting with, right? Like, so basically working with the families on, this is how you get the police reports. This is what you need to look for in the police reports. Um, these are gonna be the next steps that you're gonna have to jump through um, for these things. So, you know, educating families around these crashes that are the victims um, is huge. Um, you know, I, that's obviously that's Tiffany's wheelhouse and I'm sure she would love to, you know, continue to kind of, you know, grow her capacity to work with as many of these families as possible. Um, you know, I would love to see, we would love to see a hit and run fund for these families, right? Um, you know, we're, we're basically vic having these people get victimized on the street, get run over on the street. Um, and then we just kind of, well, sorry, you can't help, you know, there's nobody here to help you after that point. Um, you know, so either direct funding for those families and whatever support they need or reward money to keep those, you know, those, those, uh, those crashes at the top of the media spotlight, I think would be huge. Um, Patrick, you know, in the, in the, I'm, I'm so sorry to cut you off, but we have a lot of folks who want to make comments. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll drop a link. I mean, I basically, be. like, I really, I really hope that there are other people that are sitting here that have some weight behind them. Well, again, we're asking for 1% goes to education and 1% goes to enforcement. That is, again, the exact same amount of money that is going to Brandon Bosley's local park in this bill. And so we think that it should go to a citywide education and enforcement plan. Great, thank you so much for sharing that. Judith and then Bryce. Um, I just wanna make sure that Del Mar Boulevard does not get left out. Um, Del Mar is known as the um, great racial divide between North and South St. Louis. It has had several crashes and um, um, people have died. I just wanna make sure that when we're talking about these other areas that Del Mar Boulevard, all the way from Banner Vendor to the city limits, gets attention as well. Thanks, Judith, for bringing that up and, and pointing that out. Bryce. Hi, um, I was just curious if you, Liz, or anyone else on this call had any insight about how and where the streets department is intending to prioritize those sidewalk repairs with that six million dollars. I do not know. I don't think that has been defined at this point in this bill. Okay. Yeah. My my understanding is it's int intentionally somewhat ambiguous so that they can kind of respond where there's need. Um, and I would I would guess that it's probably going to be prioritized based on the existing process, which would be CSB requests. But that I don't know if Grace has any other information. Yeah, we haven't defined those locations yet to build off of what Taylor said. It will be based on need and previous requests as well, but I don't um, know officially which location. Okay, cool. Thank you. Do we have the opportunity to give input to those locations? We think, well, so we, whatever we say, we can we can say what we would like as the CMC. Um, so if there is input that we'd like to provide, I think we are likely to provide it at a slightly higher level. Um, but certainly I think we would like to be able to give feedback to the streets department on where they they invest their funds. Okay, and then, I would just... then I will recommend again, Delmar. Um, we're currently surveying Delmar Boulevard for the sidewalks and the street conditions at this point. 
And um, that repair money would go a long way in helping with the revitalization of the area. Thanks, Judy. Jackie. Thanks, Liz. I think one of the biggest questions I have about this bill is related to money for a citywide mobility plan being allocated to the streets department. I wasn't aware that they managed plans. Um, and so I was kind of wondering about the capacity for them to manage a planning project or a track record of managing a plan and implementation. Um, I, I don't know why the money was allocated there and I don't know if there's room to change that, but that I think is a big question mark. Especially because no one in that department focuses on multimodal transportation options. Thanks, Jackie, for raising that. And that's definitely a, another question that we can bring up. Um, I want to I want to see just if there are any final questions. We I've seen there's lots of comments in the chat. I have not raised those, but we have definitely captured them. Okay, I want to, um, Rachel. Just one quick question. It, it might have been in there and I might have missed it and I apologize. Um, and this can be really costly. And with our population changing and the travel times on the roads, are we looking at um, these study, these focus areas, um, what the traffic signals, how they're synchronized and studying them and how, because I think a lot of them need to be changed. I don't think that's an explicit line item, but it's certainly something we've talked about in this group before and um, something we can raise again. Thank you. Yeah, I just thought that should be part of the board bill if they're going out to bid with a company. That's something that should be looked at. Great, thank you. Um, Mike, I know you had a chance to comment already, so I want to, we just have like about a minute left in this, so I want to see if there's any other final comments. Okay, Mike, quickly. Um, I'm looking at the funding line items and it shows 8 million for street paving arteries. Um, is there any information about, I guess, what the city considers an artery and how that money will be divided up? Um, I think to where that will be specifically located, that is not decided in this bill. Um, Taylor, do you want to talk about how arterials are determined? Uh, arterials are determined through East-West Gateway's functional classification, and I'm happy to drop that like link in the map. Um, but essentially, that's kind of based on volume and how those connect to other roadways um, through the region. Thanks, Sam. I see he dropped it in the chat. Okay. So I know there's a lot more comments to offer on board Bill 120. Um, I want to I want to say that if you do not get your comment out today, you don't get it in the chat. You have something else you want to make sure that we that we're thinking about as we um, draft our own response. Um, you can email that to me. We'll be doing that in the next 24 hours. Um, I want to just make a couple of comments on things that I've observed and things that I've heard. So um, Sam said this in the chat also, but to me, I think it's really critical, especially based on conversations we've had in this space, that all these investments align with our ADA transition plan and are supporting our transition um, to a more accessible city. Um, I think that the funding for the plan is particularly important. That's something that we've been asking for, to have a comprehensive approach to addressing transportation across the city. Um, and then finally, I want to echo what, what Patrick brought up about um, there, there's more than one way to solve this problem. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity for us to think about what are some of the ways that we could um, we could ask for education and especially for involving our young people in a, in a real cultural shift around the way we think about transportation, we think about responsibility of having an automobile or being near an automobile. Um, so I, I, those, I think those are discussions that we will continue um, as we draft these. Um, I want to give Grace a chance if there's anything she wants to wrap up with as our mayor's office rep. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, everyone. This is super helpful, <clears throat> and I would say that there is still time to make changes to the board bill if there is anything that was crucial that was left out. And, of course, it comes <clears throat> with potentially having to reduce a different line item because there isn't unlimited ARPA funding available. So there is, of course, weighing what looking at things across the board. So I am interested to see what the CMC letter overall will be and the type of recommendations in terms of 
things like education, when that letter was sent from BWORKS, we did share it internally with the respective departments. I know that they are looking at the different education efforts that we may be able to do internally that if we were to shift priorities in how our departments were doing different work versus what would need to be funded. And so again, those type of letters with specific recommendations are always helpful for us and internally to structure the conversation. So thank you all for participating and sharing that information. And of course, you know how to reach me and other folks that attend these calls um, if there's any follow-up you need to chat about. Liz, can I ask Grace a question real quick? Uh, yes. Grace, do you think the bill will come out by the end of the year or it'll carry over to the beginning of next year? As of now, there is an additional HUD committee hearing scheduled before the Board of Aldermen go on their break for the winter. So if things still hold as of where things are, the committee hearing will be in the new year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to move us into our, our next agenda section, uh, which is about leadership. It is the end of the year. Um, so as we've communicated via email, uh, we are today accepting nominations by yourself or someone else for leadership of the CMC in 2023. Um, I'm putting the link in the chat to the document that we have shared that outlines the, um, the options. The roles, there are two different versions of this. One is the version that we've been doing this year, which is chair and vice chair. Um, alternatively, have a version that is uh, co-chairs. So I want to emphasize that um, Taylor and I are happy to be replaced if anyone would like to be chair or vice chair or co-chairs. Um, we are really, we, we encourage that. We welcome that. No one reached out to me, so I hope that's just because you've been percolating in it. Um, but we will now accept nominations, either via chat or via voice. Uh, and if there are any candidates, they are welcome to say something about themselves. I want to say what happens after this process. So um, it, whoever is nominated, I will ask them for a brief biography and their commitment that they can fulfill the duties um, via email following this meeting. That's then going to be sent to the voting members by next week, and we'll request their vote on the candidates. Uh, candidates will be voted in as voting members at the same time um, in order to serve in these positions. If the current chair and vice chair are not remaining in their positions, they will become general members of the committee by default, so they will lose their voting member status. Um, we will confirm leadership uh, for 2023 to all members before the holidays. Okay, so... Uh, I would like to make a nomination. I'd like to nominate Taylor March to be vice chair. But again, we are opening up nominations if there are any other nominations. Not hearing anyone speak up, I would nominate Liz to be chair again, um, unless anybody else is interested in either one of these. Uh, <laughs> um okay i'm i'm gonna accept that nomination and i am assuming because taylor did not refuse he will also accept this nomination would anyone else like to nominate someone else or themselves next year we promise someone will actually get nominated. Uh, okay, so we'll follow up with voting members. Um, thank you all for letting us uh, facilitate these conversations for the last year. Uh, we look forward to another year. Oh, Christy, okay, great. Thank you, Christy. We will follow up with you. Uh, that is excellent to hear. And okay. Anyone else? And Christy, do you want to say anything? You don't have to. No, I don't have anything to say. Okay, we'll follow up with you after the meeting. I will, I will just say, I've met Christy and talked with her quite a bit. I would vouch for her and would happily pull my, my nomination so that Christy's the only one. So it's just, it's nice and clean. So um, second Christy's <laughs> nomination. 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, Chrissy, well, thank you for stepping up. Uh, Patrick is nominating Charles. Charles, do you accept the nomination? Well, I, I can see that Patrick and I are no longer friends. Uh, no, I, I respectfully would, <laughs> would decline the nomination um, and yield to Liz and uh, Christy to do the work. But I appreciate that, Patrick, I really do. Thank you. Maybe we can get him next year, Patrick. All right, everyone. Uh, I'm going to close the nominations. If anyone feels they did not get to nominate someone, you can always send us a message. Um, Christy, I will follow up with you. Thank you so much for stepping up, uh, and we appreciate that. Okay, in our last eight minutes, I am going to move us to our subcommittee updates. Um, and as usual, don't ever quite have enough time. Um, engagement committee, I am going to end with you. So, uh, this is the wrong document, sorry. Sorry, everybody. There we go. Um, so engagement committee, I will end with you. Um, so let's start with um, micromobility. Would you mind giving a quick update? Sure. Um, we, the micromobility committee, is the committee that's looking at best practices for micromobility services in St. Louis. Um, those are what we see in the street with scooters or uh, bike share, e-bikes, things like that. As everybody probably knows, in St. Louis, we only have scooter companies operating at the moment. Um, the committee was formed when there was a pause on these devices in downtown. Um, our next meeting is to be determined. What we've been working on so far is reviewing the draft permit update that these companies have to have in order to operate on St. Louis streets. Um, we provided feedback to the mayor's office and planning design agency on that draft permit update. And the goal of updating that permit is to uh, basically get better control of these companies and have a more managed program on the city side of things, as opposed to um, just the companies kind of coming in and having a free for all. So we did reach back out to the mayor's office and planning design agency, and we've heard that they're waiting on comments from the companies that were currently operating on their uh, response to the draft permit update. And once we are able to get back together, I will let everybody know when the next meeting is. I did just want to note that the National Association of City Transportation Officials, NACTO, has recently released some really great guidance on permit updating and uh, program management in cities. I'll try to drop, drop a link to that in the chat. And they're actually hosting a webinar tomorrow on that new guidance that was released. So I think that's it. And my, my email is on there if you want to get involved. Thanks, Jackie. Um, Rachel, brief update on Safe Streets. Yep. Um, we covered a lot this past month. Um, we were talking about what state legislation with bringing back driver's ed and um, as well as hands-free. Um, Peter Meredith's office sent me um, a, a document with everything that's um, being discussed that's filed for hands-free. and. Um, bills that were filed for bringing back driver's ed. So this is being discussed. So yay, hopefully this happens. Um, also, Jackie and I are going to be meeting with the with Bethany from the streets department um, to discuss a database to be created to show what streets are being paved. So everyone's aware of that. So we're having a meeting in a couple of weeks to discuss that. And then also I had a meeting uh, earlier this week with MoDOT to discuss their PSAs and they would love to hear what ideas we have um, on that. Also, they, um, the Missouri Coalition of Roadway Safety, um, they are a member of that and they asked me to join the committee and I would love to. And if anyone else wants to join the Missouri Coalition of Roadway Safety Committee, please email me, my email's right there. Uh, so they would love to have um, representation from our group on this um, coalition. And the website is safemolives.com. Again, savemolives.com. 
is the website. And there's a lot of great statistics on there about crashes and a lot of great data for us to look at, especially what we want to focus on on PSA campaigns. And then also after this call, I have a meeting with Lieutenant Lauer. Um, he's with the he's and um, runs the traffic division. So we're going to be talking about what can we do about uh, more officers in the traffic division. That's one thing that came out of our committee that we would like to see. And I'm just want to understand what are the needs and wants of the traffic division and how we can support them. And Patrick, I am going to bring up your concern about that police reports that were written. So I'm going to let him know what you what you stated today about that. Um, so that's a little alarming how police reports are being made, but I'm going to let uh, Lieutenant Lauer know that as well. Um, and then we're doing some homework and research on, you know, um, data um, about putting temporary barricades up, like what happened south um, on South Grand um, that has been put in the middle turn lane and how we should have um, BPS support more initiatives like that. So we're putting together data to meet with Richard Bradley to discuss that. And, um, and then there was a few other things we're working on, but that's a lot. So I just don't want to go on and on forever, but I'm meeting with a lot of people and we're doing a lot of research and homework and we're hoping in the next month or so to have more um, information to present to the committee and as well as provide to Grace. So thanks everyone for your time. Great, thanks, Rachel. Um, Dawn, I'm gonna hand it over to you for engagement. Great, uh, Liz, can you put up the slide that I shared with you? Uh, excellent, okay, so it is December. So uh, we have our update about the Open Streets Initiative for anyone who is new. Um, we leave uh, seats open in our voting member block uh, to ensure that the voting member grouping of the CMC represents the demographics of the city of St. Louis. Um, so I listed out exactly how the initiative is going. I'm just gonna do a brief overview. Um, the engagement subcommittee received six applications between our last update in June and uh, yesterday. Uh, two applicants were added as voting members, one identified as Black and the other as Arab. Uh, the voting member who identifies as Arab, please note, is not counted in the numbers shared on this slide as their identity falls outside of the U.S. Census racial demographic groups, uh, which was used to create the Open Streets Initiative. Even, even so, we felt it important to um, note their uh, preferred identity. Um, it's also important to note that some of the applicants are double counted because of the intersectionality of race, location, and having a disability. Um, at the moment, the CMC, excuse me, has 15 voting members. Our bylaws allows for 31 voting members. But like I said, with the Open Seats Initiative, we're leaving open seats open so that we reflect the community. Um, another thing to note is uh, we had Charles and I received no suggestions on the policies that we shared with uh, everyone prior to this meeting. Uh, so afterwards, voting members will vote to approve those policies. Uh, the policies covered like if there was a conflict of interest, if there was a disagreement, if um, what was the process like for reapplication, just things that we needed to confirm that we're not covered in our bylaws. And I'm gonna shift over now to Charles to talk very briefly about Vision Zero. Charles, Charles. Sure, thanks Dawn. Um, so on December 13th at seven o'clock, there will be a uh, Zoom, I guess, uh, that will be in two parts. First is the Vision Zero Network. The national organization will be, um, coming on and talking about what Vision Zero is, uh, how it got started, how how cities started and what it looks like. And then we're gonna have uh, KC Vision Zero will come on and finish it off with how they got it started, what things that they did, um, what barriers they saw to getting it started and where they are in the process now. So it'll cover about an hour. Uh, we would like the, the message spread out. We'll make sure that it's uh, videoed, I'm sorry, recorded so that uh, if you don't, if you're not able to be there, uh, certainly you can use it as a reference material as we move forward uh, with what I think is, is an important um, uh, prospect for the city of St. Louis and that is Vision Zero. So, uh, and I'll be glad to answer any questions.
Great. Thanks, Charles and Don. Um, I put the link in the chat. Uh, so that is uh, that that's our last CMC event of 2022. Um, we are quickly coming up to the end of the year. Our first CMC meeting in 2023 will be Wednesday, January 25th. Um, but we will be in touch quite a bit between now and then, particularly with respect to the board bill as it makes its way through the process, um, providing feedback and input on that. Uh, I want to thank all of you for your time today, your contributions, and for all of the efforts this year on having attention paid to this in, uh, the incredible issues that we are dealing with in our city. Um, I'm just, I, it is a pleasure to work with all of you. So thank you for being part of this group um, and for contributing. I hope everyone has a safe uh, and healthy holiday, um, and we'll look forward to seeing you in 2023. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Liz.